Sunil Shastri is a consultant, educator and speaker in ocean and environmental governance. Since 1982, Sunil has made it his mission to protect ocean life and has worked ever since to inspire and guide others on how we can achieve Passam in Maribus, peace in the ocean. In this presentation, he discusses how our seas are interconnected as a single global ocean and how we can make a difference to our ocean environment. Thank you for having me. Uh, I am always excited and delighted to be associated with your work uh, uh, because thrivability matters. And uh, Morris and I go, go back some time now and we have been interacting uh, both online uh, and also doing some, some good work uh, together. So I hope uh, you will find today's talk uh, of some relevance, some interest. Uh, I want to, first of all, uh, just say that uh, I would like to like you to, of course, look at the uh, Thrive logo, which is in the top bottom corner, but also look at the uh, my, my own logo, which is on the top right hand corner, uh, as you can see, and that's ocean and environmental governance. And if you see the six circles below it, so I want to quickly uh, mention where I come from. And those six circles denote actually uh, people, planet, profit. So that's one triptych. So the first triptych being ocean and environmental governance. So ocean, environment, governance, that being the first triptych. The second triptych being people, planet, and profit. And the third triptych being equity, justice, and peace. So that's what the whole idea of my approach is, and which we'll talk about a little bit later. So the title of my talk is One Ocean, Three Approaches, Five Issues, and Seven Solutions. <clears throat> I'm sorry, Sunil, you seem to have gone back to mute. Would you mind unmuting yourself? Right, sorry. Yeah, the, the first slide now you see, you see here, and this is known as the famous Earthrise picture. Now this became an iconic picture for best part of now 74 years or so. Uh, and it's taken by uh, William Anders on the Apollo 8 mission uh, in, on 24th of December, 1968. Now that shows for the first time, uh, earthlings, human beings who went to the moon or went around in the space, they for the first time could see that the earth was actually rising. So just as we see sunrise and moonrise every day, we could see the earth rise. And that was the first time people saw that and people then recognized how important the earth was and how unique the earth was. And all our, you're, you're talking about our ancestors and families and friends and all that. Everything that we know of mankind, the entire history of our mankind is all in that one planet and nowhere else. And that's what we have to focus on. So just as that whole idea of that one planet, I want to introduce this idea of one ocean to start with. So the, if you look at my website, the landing page says our whole thinking must change. And the first change that has to come into our thinking is this whole concept that one ocean is what we have to think of. We, have, we, we don't refer to the ocean in the plural, but we talk in terms of single ocean. So we have defined in the past for whatever, whatever reasons, we call them three oceans, five oceans, seven oceans, etc. But there's only one ocean as just as we have only one planet. Now, if you look at the Pacific alone, the Pacific alone is larger than the surface area of Mars. So, you know, people are trying to go to the Mars, you know, the billionaire, billionaires are trying to go to the Mars, but we should be looking after our planet that we have rather than going to the Mars and Mars is not going to solve our problems that, that the earth is going to do. Five moons can be placed by side by side across the Pacific. So you can see how big the Pacific alone is. And all the continents can fit in the Pacific, which has 50% of all the water on the earth. And antipodes, you know, the points opposite on the Earth, you have Pacific is so large that you can have an antipode in Chile and, and Peru, and it's just off, offshore of Vietnam and China. So the ocean is a classic example also of our VUCA world. Our world is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous in many different ways, in political, social, economic, and so on, but also in natural phenomena in that point, from that point of view. And an ocean is a classic example of this VUCA world uh, that, that we are in. Now, the whole idea of one ocean 
uh, came from the Spillhaus projection in 1942. And this Spillhaus projection has now suddenly taken off in the last three, four years. If you see in the literature, there's a lot of talk about the Spillhaus projection. And the Spillhaus projection is a different type of different way at of looking at our world. And this looks at the Antarctica as a center and then the rest of the world around it. And then you can actually you know, make out that the entire ocean is interlinked. You know, if you see all the, all the water bodies that, that are there on the earth, they're all ocean linked together. And that's what gives a picture of one ocean. And that's where I want to, uh, you know, have, have the, uh, you know, focus on of today's talk. So how big is the ocean? The ocean is 71% of the earth. That's what, that's what we always hear. But it's also 99% of the living space. The sea land ratio is 60 to 40 in the northern hemisphere. So there's, there's more land in the northern hemisphere and 80, 20 where, where you are in Australia in the southern hemisphere. Average depth is 3,733. And this is the Mawson Peak in, in Australia, which is 2,745. So it's deeper than the average uh, and the tallest peak in Australia. And the deepest point is 11,000 uh, meters, over 11,000 meters. And that is much, much deeper than Mount Everest is tall. So the big oceanic ridge, the, the ones that connect all the plate boundaries, that itself is 64,000 kilometers long. It's four times longer than all the mountain ranges on land combined and over 2000 kilometers wide. So I mean, that, that's a, that gives, a, gives you a sort of a feeling for how big the ocean is. And it contains of course, 96.5% of all the water on the earth that's, that is in the ocean. And the rest of the water is scattered in small percentages as, as you can see there on land and in permanent ice and so on. So, so that's, that's, that's about the one ocean. Now I want to come to three approaches. Now I have taken, this is, this is very personal, in the sense that these are the three approaches that I have taken throughout my life in terms of what I call as advice, advocacy, and action. So the first one, advice, the, together at, at the time of my, my, my mentor's death, my father and my mentor died within 10 days of each other in February 2002. And I was sort of at a meeting in Paris paying tribute to Elizabeth at the UNESCO in Paris. And that's when the idea of the seven pillars of ocean and environmental governance struck my head, you know, this whole idea of seven pillars of ocean governance. And that became the, the vehicle of my advice, as it were, advice is a vehicle for earning a living, as I call it now. But that, that became the vehicle for my thinking or my philosophy or my philosophy that was influenced by Elizabeth Mann Borghese. The title is stolen from what I call as Seven Pillars of Wisdom, which is by T. Lawrence, the famous Lawrence of Arabia. I consider it to be a very unreadable text, uh, but also it is sim similarly, it's similar uh, to the brief history of time, which is also unreadable. But you know, these are books that uh, one must read to understand how our world works. And of course, my clients are educational institutes, research institutions, and so on. And I jokingly say that I will talk to anybody who will listen to me. I will even talk to people who don't listen to me as long as they pay me, but that's another story. <clears throat> so the second approach that I have always taken is advocacy. So from time to time, I get excited about people, uh, other people's uh, act, act, activities. For example, what, what Thrivability Matters is doing. And I would be their spokesperson. I'll speak at their events or I'll talk about their activities or help in their activities or contribute in whatever way I can to their activities. And that's what I call as advocacy. So I always go through this, uh, this whole idea of uh, the advocacy in my mind, in, in the way I think about it is about giving. So it is, it is our moral duty to give. So in my case, obviously I give something else, which I'll come back to in a second, but most importantly, what I, what I try to want to try, try and give is whatever little knowledge and expertise that I have. In fact, I have stopped using the word expert nowadays. I you know, introduced me as expert, but I call myself educator. So consultant, educator, and speaker. So whatever little knowledge and expertise that I have, I want to give it away. And that's what, uh, that's part of uh, our moral duty to give. Now, you have, you have to think of it from a global perspective. At a national and international level, there was a voluntary, voluntary yet unfulfilled commitment made that 0.7% of GDP of course will be given to overseas development administration uh, uh, assistance by what we are called as the OECD countries, the advanced industrialized countries of the world. This was done in 1970. So that's 52 years ago. 
Now, this has not been fulfilled. And this would work out today. In today's sums, it would work out to $400 billion annually. Now, this compares with yet another unfulfilled $100 billion annual climate commitment that was made in Copenhagen in 2009. Again, that's not been fulfilled. So 2009 to 2022, we should have had you know, something like $1,300 billion collected in this fund, but that has not been collected. By contrast, for example, the NATO countries spend on average of 2.5% of their GDP on defense. So you can see here, so they can afford to spend money on defense, but not on overseas development assistance. So what could this $400 billion actually mean? It would mean servicing of the SDGs, that the 17 SDGs that we are talking about, dealing with death, death disease and destruction caused by all sorts of uh, natural phenomena, as well as the recent COVID phenomena and so on. And of course, natural disaster mitigation. So all of that is very important. And of course, one of the issues that I'm excited about is universal basic in income, but that's something we can talk about other time. The other approach that I have is what I call as, you know, action, what, what little I can do. So going back to our, it is our moral duty to give, I have decided to myself that I would give 10% of my gross income to, to good causes uh, since 2002. So last 20 years, I'm very proud that I have been doing that. So, so that is, those are the three approaches that I have taken personally. So that's, that's a very personal thing. But then let me come to the five questions or the five issues that, that are facing us, that face mankind, I would rather call, I would call them even existential issues. So why are we here where, where we are? You know, that's, that's the first question or first issue that comes to my mind. It's the wants and the needs. The Mahatma said that, you know, nothing is, I mean, the Mahatma said that he did distinguish between wants and needs. He says that uh, there's enough in the world for the need of everybody, but not enough in the world for the greed of anybody. Now, nothing is ever any good for us until we can cut, dig, or kill it. Think about it. You know, we cannot value add, we, we lovingly call it, we have, have had added value to it when you cut, dig, or kill something. And that's when we, we think that we have added value to it. But the humans added burn to it. So we, we, we went one step further. Animals also do cut and dig and kill, but they do it within their ecological means, we don't. So we have then gone on to add burn to it. So burn, cut, dig and kill is what value adds for us. In our addiction, and that has created our addiction to fossil fuel, which means that we have gone from 283 parts per million in the year 1800 to 313 parts per million in 1955 when I was born. And in my own lifetime, that number has gone to 418. In fact, it may be 400, almost 420 uh, as of this year. So in a matter of 67 years, we have gone up that much. In addition, all the pollutants in the form of fertilizers, pesticides, chemicals, heavy metals, industrial and municipal waste, all of these, they not only are contaminating our land, our water, but also our ocean. So as a result of this, we have become a lawless society. We become landless, airless, and waterless. So that's, that's one of the first issues that we are facing. The second one, the second existential issue is what are, you know, what are our three existential issues if you think of them? So let's think of COVID as a small existential issue, but it's be here today, gone tomorrow. It may be there for de decades, or some people say that we have to live with COVID, but it's a smaller problem as compared to some of the bigger problems that we have. If you compare COVID to a, to a berry, to a small berry, I would compare climate change, which is a much bigger issue to an orange, but even bigger than that, which people don't, don't know about or don't, don't think about, uh, too much about, are disruption of nitrogen cycle, which can be compared to a papaya. So disruption of nitrogen cycle, the one that I mentioned to you because of the use of excessive fertilizers chem and chemicals and so on. And then even bigger than that is the loss of biological diversity. So that's, that could be compared to a, to a watermelon. So those are the three huge existential issues that are facing us. And to, ex to read more about these in details, I would recommend you to read the Stern Review, which is called Economics of Climate Change, which was published nearly 16 years ago, and the Das Gupta Review on Economics of Biological Diversity that was published just last year. So why is the ocean significance, uh, significant for our, our whole existence, really, basically? So the Pacific alone is bigger than the surface of Mars and can accommodate all seven continents, like I, like, like I mentioned to you. 
only about 5%. So this is the key thing. Only about 5% of the ocean has been explored and mapped. So we, we need to learn so much more about the ocean. In fact, the United Nations has launched last year, the United Nations Decade for uh, Ocean Science for Sustainable Development or the ocean that we want. So ocean absorbs 25% of carbon dioxide, generates 50 to 80% of, so every, every second breath, or in, in fact, every uh, one in two, uh, sorry, three in, uh, two in three breaths that we're taking is coming as a result of oxygen that is generated by the ocean. 70% of the Earth's surface, we've seen that, receives 80% of land-based pollution. All the pollution that we have on land ends up in the ocean. And 80% perhaps is an understatement. There's more pollution ending up in the ocean from land than, than anywhere else. Could, could well be in the 90s in the, in the percent. Absorbs 90% of excess heat from all the emissions that we, that we have, including our famous you know, addiction to burning fossil fuel. Carries 95% of world trade, contains 97% of Earth's water, and offers 99% of biosphere that we've seen. But more importantly, this thing that we're doing, you know, this, this, this video web webinar that we're having, that is also happening because of, because of the fact that 99% of all communication cables are laid under the ocean. And much of this communication on the internet is happening not because of the cloud up in the sky, but the cloud which is actually in, in, the, in the ocean submarine cables. So where, where in nature can we find simple solutions? Now, now, nature is very simple. And if you leave nature to it for some time, in fact, uh, uh, George Clover has just recently written a book, uh, Rewilding the Ocean. And he says that basically, if you let the nature, if, if you give, give the nature a break, then the nature will revive and survive and thrive again. It will come back, it will bounce back. So just as we need trillion new trees on land, and I call this a TNT initiative. TNT, as you probably know, is, a, is an explosive tree nitrotoline. But I'm not talking of, of that explosive. I'm talking about an explosion of trees. So just as we need trillion new trees on land, we, we, have, we need to have mangroves, seagrass, and corals, which, which should be in the coastal, coastal zone. Those are our triple insurance against imminent climate catastrophe. So that's, that's very important to remember. So creating this whole idea that we have a plethora of mangroves, seagrass, and coral reefs activities uh, to grow them in our coastal and uh, intertidal zone would be very crucial. Then how must our narrative change? So this is another uh, important sort of question. Our narratives are wrong. Initially, our narrative was that the ocean is too big to fail. So, so what we thought, what we said was, oh, we could do anything to the ocean. We could take as much fish as we like. You're doing a project on fish. So you could take as much fish as, as you like. In fact, it has been historically said that fish could be taken ad, ad infinitum. You know, you could take as much fish as you like this, this season, and you could carry on doing that season after the season, and there'll be more fish left in the ocean. But that is not true. The ocean is too big to fail, we said, but we have proved and we have shown that the ocean, we have failed the ocean. The ocean has not failed, but we have failed the ocean. Then. The next narrative came and the next narrative says, the ocean is too big to fix. So then we said, oh, we threw up our hands in the air and we said, oh no, the damage is now done and we cannot do anything to fix it now. Ocean is too big to fix. No, that's the that's a, that's a wrong narrative too. So the correct narrative is the ocean is too big to ignore. The ocean is too big to ignore and we ignore the ocean at, only at our own peril. And, uh, and we, have to, we have to remember this, that it is the, I mean, the whole, whole promise has got to be protect the planet that provides and the ocean is too big to ignore because it is the one that is providing us. And if we ignore it, we'll ignore so at our own peril. So in terms of solutions, I think of so seven solutions which come from my uh, own idea of seven pillars of ocean and environmental governance. So the first one of those is science and technology. So it is about seeking knowledge and acquiring wisdom. So it's a double-edged sword. It creates problems, but also provides solutions. Science is about imagination. Einstein famously said that science is, knowledge is more important than imag imagination. So the imagination is more important than knowledge because knowledge is limited, imagination is unlimited. And dreams, dreams are very important because it's only when you imagine you can think and you can create something new. And that's what is the motto 
of the World Intellectual Property Organization. My mentor, Elizabeth Mann Borghese, used to say, utopians of today are realists of tomorrow, but realists of today are dead tomorrow. So you have to be dreaming, imagining, thinking, and creating things. And that's the, that's the purpose of science and technology. So that's the first solution. Geopolitical economy, whose resources are they, are they and who benefits from those resources? You know, this whole idea of privatization of profits and socialization of costs, you know, that has got to be avoided. We, there is a carbon trail from everything, from production to consumption, to waste recycling, to residue, all of that has got a carbon trail. So there's nothing, no activity that is not producing this increase in uh, the, 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 the carbon in the atmosphere. So that has got to be checked. Transboundary nature of impact is increasingly evident in everything that we do. Pollution, disasters, epidemics. We have seen, you know, COVID this time, which is global uh, uh, impact, transboundary impact. Herman Dali, the famous economist says that the economy, and this is something that we have to remember, that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, not the other way around. So the, the economy can only grow if the environment is there to support. If the environment has been decimated, then the economy will never, uh, never, never gain pace. Institutions and organizations, what sort of institutions do we want? And what sort of organizations do we want? We want to have democratic institutions. We want to move out of file. We want to move out of bureaucracy and move into life, into governance. So less government and more governance. Everybody promises that. If you see the election campaigns of any gov any, any, any country, they, they, will, they will talk about less government and more governance. But you know, that, that is where the, where the checks and balances have got to be. The beauty of democracy is that somehow creates uh, an economics, uh, an ecosystem of checks and balances. At least it ought to create that. And that's, that's the kind of institutions and organizations we want. The next one is legislation implementation. The most important, the golden rule in lawmaking is don't legislate what you can't implement. The continuous development, periodic review, uniform application of rule of law. These are very important as, law, as far as legislation and implementation are concerned. Juice Kogens, you know, the peremptory norms. Pollution is a crime against environment, just as genocide is a crime against humanity. Now, recently, uh, you, you would have heard that there has been a there's been a declaration passed by the United Nations which which gives the right to a healthy environment to all citizens all 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 people. Exhortative principles: do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Very very important. Shift from crime to punishment. Polluter pays principle. You know, rather than waiting for somebody to commit the crime and then punishing them for the crime, we are we are saying, okay, why don't we use the preventative principle? Call it's called the preventing crime to be committed in the first place, and we call it the precautionary principle. So thus we can move, this legislation implementation can create, I talked about being lawless, we become lawless, we have to move to a lawful society from being a lawless society, and that's how we can achieve that. Role of civil society, what is civil society? We are all part of the civil society, stakeholders, women and youth. Women are 50% of the world and the youth will reside there in the future. So it's very important that we, we pay attention to women and youth in our, in our society. In, in fact, education of uh, the girl child, which is so crucial. We all talk, uh, talk about rights, but what about responsibility? Corporate social responsibility. So we talk about uh, what other people should do, what the government should be doing, or what the large corporation should be doing, but what about individual social responsibility? Principle 10 of Rio Declaration of Agenda 21 talks of and says that environmental issues are best handled by participation of all concerned citizens. So that's very important to remember. Financial initiatives, obviously do the right thing to, uh, because it's the right thing to do. That's a good motto to have. But how do you get the money to do the right things that you want to do? So public-private partnership, private finance initiatives, foreign direct investment, there are a lot of these, uh, you know, in, intergovernmental banks, uh, international intergovernmental banks, which are giving what we call as uh, uh, incremental funding for environmental projects. So if you do environmental good, they will provide incremental funding uh, to your projects. So the famous thing to remember here is the enterprises do stuff to make money, but environmentalists do need money to do stuff. So it is very important that to do the right thing, we must have the 
right amount of resources to, to, to focus on. And finally, uh, education awareness, which is my central pillar and which I consider to be uh, an important pillar. Uh, each one of us belongs to at least one of these seven pillars and we can adapt them as a central pillar. So you can take any of those pillars, one of us, each one of us belongs to them. But for me, this is an important pillar because education can be both formal and informal from age eight to 80. Curiosity is very important. You know, as long as you are curious, then you, you have, you are contributing something to life. You know, so whatever age, it doesn't matter. Uh, Mid-career training, continuing professional development, lifelong learning, whatever you like to call it, but that is very important. And then uh, facilitation and stakeholder dialogues, public, sec uh, public speaking engagement, so on and so forth. Uh, there's a famous quote by Baba Dume of Senegal, and he says, in the end, we'll protect what we love, love only what we understand, and understand only what we are taught. So those are my sort of short, sort of a very quick run through my one ocean, three approaches, five questions and seven solutions. Some final thoughts. This is very important. I, I quoted Mahatma Gandhi earlier uh, and I'm just going to sort of rejig his words. And this is by Mick Jagger. So pick your hero, Mick Jagger or Mahatma Gandhi, it doesn't matter. But he says that you can't always get what you want. But if you try sometime, you'll find you get what you need. Same thing as what Mahatma Gandhi said. Mahatma Gandhi said that there's enough in the world for everybody's need, but not, in the, not enough in the world for everybody's greed. Then our whole thinking must change. My, my landing page said that. And the change has got to come from within. So it's got to be internal. It's got, you must, it, it must change, you must change yourself. And each one of us has got to be that agent of change. Do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. I'll talk about the pin diagram at some other time, maybe through question and answers. But the most important thing that we can do in, whenever we want to do something new is honesty of purpose and clarity of purpose. And there's a story of a young boy of, uh, on a beach and, uh, and the starfish. So there's a young boy on the beach on a hot sunny day and the beach is boiling hot. Like these days, things are getting hot all over the world and he's and the beach is strewn with starfish and this boy as he walks along he picks up a starfish and throws it into the water and he keeps doing that he's constantly picking up a starfish and throwing it into the water and there's an old man passing by and he says young man what are you doing he says i'm i'm saving this starfish and he says there are millions of starfish strewn around on the beaches of the world how many are you going to save so this boy pick, bends down again, picks up another starfish and throws it into the sea and says, I made a difference to that one, you know, and that's the difference that we have to make by being, uh, being active as you are in your work as uh, Thriveability Matters, as Morris Fidel is doing, coordinating this whole activity and uh, your thousands of uh, followers and volunteers and so on that we have around the world. Uh, uh, like I said, thank you very much. Uh, I always say that it's not the end of the problem, but solutions must begin somewhere. And that's, that, that's you know, where the solutions have to begin from each one of us. Each one has got to be the uh, sort of agent of change. And just to, uh, you know, conclude, uh, I want to leave, these are some practical solutions to reverse climate change. And I'll just leave the screen on for a second, for a, for a couple of seconds for you to look at. And those are things that some of them are within our capacity. Some of them we can do ourselves. Some of them need government intervention. Some of them need industrial interventions. But there are a lot of stuff that we can do ourselves here. There are top 10 solutions to reverse climate change. So let me stop here now. Uh, we'll, we'll have uh, Maurice talking about things. Uh, here are my, uh, here's my email address and my uh, WhatsApp number and my, uh, and my website. So please visit it and uh, please feel free to ask me any questions and please contact me on my email or my WhatsApp. Thank you very much. <laughs>